is your host, Brian McClanahan. Welcome back to the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. This is your host, Brian McClanahan, and this is episode 180, covering the week of July 29th through August 2nd, 2019. Glad to have you back on the program. Very glad to be here. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter at Abbeville Institute. Like our Facebook page at Abbeville Institute and subscribe to our YouTube page at Abbeville Institute. If you don't want to find all those things on your own, just go to our webpage, abbevilleinstitute.org. At the top of the page, you'll find all of our social media buttons. While you're there, give us an email address and we'll give you a free ebook. You'll get our daily dose of Dixie Monday through Friday and our weekly email on Saturday or Sunday. You can support the Abbeville Institute by going to our webpage, abbevilleinstitute.org. At the top of the page, you'll see a button that says support. Click on that and you'll see donor options. You can donate monthly, annually, or a one-time donation. And all your donations are tax deductible to the full extent of the law. So please help us explore what is true and valuable in the Southern tradition. That means this podcast, our website, our programs, uh, all the things that we do to try to ensure that we keep that tradition alive. You can also support the Institute by going to that same uh, button. It says support. You'll have a drop-down menu. It'll say shop. Click on that. You can get your Abbeville Institute apparel. So if you want to uh, help advertise the Institute with high-quality embroidered materials, you can do that. T-shirts, hats, golf shirts, golf towels, a lot of great stuff. So go on out and get your Abbeville Institute apparel. It, uh, again, is a great way to advertise and also a great way to support the Institute. Okay, well, all that said, let's talk about the material for the week. We had a, an eclectic week, but um, several, of the, several of the pieces went together, um, the last two in particular. And um, But we had some other interesting material this week, and all of it, I think, centers on the South as distinct, the South as unique. And this is not to say that other sections in the United States aren't unique, and in fact, I think that we all recognize that they are. Uh, but that's, that was the key to understanding the United States and the early federal period. If you go back and you look at the documents from, say, the 1770s, into the 1780s, when the founding generation was discussing the Union, you can go back to the 1750s for all that matter. For, for all, I mean, if you go back to that point, when you go back to the 18th century and you see what the founding generation said about America, you'll find that uh, they all recognized differences in the colonies. And it wasn't just uh, the institution of slavery, which most establishment historians would say, well, there it is, right there. That's the only thing that made the colonies different. It wasn't. David Hackett Fisher has pointed this out in his wonderful book, Albion Seed, which is uh, a discussion of the four British folkways in North America, the Cavaliers, the Celts, the Quakers, and the Puritans, and how different these cultures actually were, even though they're all British. They're all British folkways, is what he calls them, or English in the 17th century. They all were substantially different in their worldviews. They all might have been Christian, but uh, the Puritans and, of course, the Orthodox Anglicans did not see eye to eye. They fought a civil war in England. So uh, these were different cultures, and they were different <clears throat> in their cultural habits, their norms on, on just about everything. So uh, those cultures would settle here in North America, and in the process you had 13, eventually 13, very different colonies. Now, you can divide those up into sections. You can have New England. You can have the Mid-Atlantic states, would be the Mid-Atlantic states or the Mid-Atlantic colonies, and then, of course, the southern colonies and southern states. Um, but they all had different cultural makeups. And Benjamin Franklin recognized this in 1754 when he wrote during the Albany Congress, which was uh, called... Uh, in response to the growing crisis with France, and he proposed something known as the Albany Plan of Union. He said, look, all these colonies are too provincial. They don't want any type of central authority. They're all jealous of each other. They all have their own colonial spheres. They all had their own colonial legislatures. They weren't going to sit down and form some type of union, even if the parliament would agree to it, which ultimately they did not. They weren't going to do it because... They were all suspicious and jealous of each other. And so this is where you know we have this uh, this disconnect between these colonies that of course would carry forward into the 18th century. 
into the late 18th century, uh, the 1770s and 1780s. If you look at the documents from that period, they all knew that what they had there in 1776, when the colonies declared their independence separately, many of them didn't, of course, then as a through the Declaration of Independence, but even that, in 1783, the colonies were recognized all as independent states, as Jefferson said in the Declaration. The Articles of Confederation codified the fact that these were free and independent states. And so you had 13 independent countries that formed a union for specific purposes. And that was because these colonies, as Richard Henry Lee pointed out when he proposed a committee to form, or at least he proposed independence and the committee was formed, uh, he said, look, this union is not going to interfere with the everyday government of each state. Virginia was independent from Massachusetts, and Massachusetts was independent from South Carolina, and Connecticut was independent from New York. The concerns of the, do the domestic concerns of each state were left to the domestic legislatures of each state. We had a union for commerce, at least ostensibly, in defense, but more importantly, defense against the British. So that carried forward into Philadelphia. I mean, you look at the Philadelphia Convention, they all talked about the differences, and you look at how the Constitution was sold. Tench Cox, very famously in a freeman, it's a series of essays entitled A Freeman, pointed this out. The, the central government did not have control over the domestic affairs of the states, and he listed what all these things were, things like jails and education and health care, all that kind of stuff. And so this is because the, the states are supposed to recognize the individual character of each of the cultures of those particular states. The United States in 1788 was, uh, of course, much smaller. The, the total population of the United States in 1790 was about the same population as Alabama in 2019. So we're talking about a vast amount of territory with maybe 4 million people. Not a whole lot of people, a lot of wilderness out there. But even that being the case, these states were substantially different. And so... When you look at that and you understand how different these states were, and then you move forward to 2019, this term nation that we often use now to describe the United States, a national government, an American nation, the United States as a nation, it just doesn't fit. It doesn't fit at all. In fact, that was one of the key arguments at the Philadelphia Convention. Madison proposed a national government that was explicitly rejected in favor of a federal model you had a national part of the government, it was argued, in the House of Representatives, but everything else was federal. Look, the president's elected by the states. If the, if the Electoral College cannot find a majority, the president is then elected in the House of Representatives by state. The states control the Senate, at least originally, and the Senate controls both the legislative branch and the executive branch, and by default the judicial branch, because it has control over appointment powers. So the Senate is the key to the entire document, and it controls everything. The Senate can check the House of Representatives, the Senate can check the Executive Branch, and the Senate can check the Judicial Branch. The Senate is the body that tries impeachment, so the House can impeach anybody in the Executive or Judicial Branch, but the Senate gets to decide if these people are guilty. Again, the states. So the states were the entire... Uh, the, the most important part of the entire system. We forget that. We think now because the Senate is elected by direct election you know, from the states that these things are just, these senators are just like any other representative. They're not. They represent their state. And this was pointed out by North Carolina uh, during the ratification process that if the states wanted, or if states wanted to destroy the system, they just refused to elect senators and then the entire thing falls apart. Now, because we've nationalized this, because now... Uh, we have direct election of senators, and people start funding, funneling money into other states to uh, elect senators. Um, it's become a little different process. They don't re necessarily represent the state anymore. They represent their party. But regardless, uh, this was designed 
because we the, the founding generation wanted the states involved. Okay, so all of that said, what is going on in America now? First, the piece on Thursday by Alan Mendenhall, The United States is Not a Nation. Now, I've written the exact same thing under the exact same title uh, in a, on another website years ago. But he basically carries the same theme forward. We have a diverse North American continent with uh, diverse states. And so to call the United States a nation does not do the definition justice. In fact, it's inaccurate. The United States has never been a nation. This is what Abel Upshur said, John Taylor of Caroline said, when they were refuting Joseph Story and, um, and others. Uh, that would be like utopia for utopians. It just doesn't exist. The United States is not a nation and has never been a nation. So uh, that's an important point to drive home. And this is one of the things... The Abbeville Institute, when it was founded, one of the first videos we ever did, and this is Don Livingston's pet project, um, and, and when he was back in 2002, was always talking about size and scope and scale and how big the United States was and what the, the Southern tradition politically and what that offered for the United States in the future. And that was simply uh, discussions of things like federalism, secession, nullification. Uh, that was part of the Southern tradition. He said, and so when you're looking at a continent, which is what the you know, I mean, the the, ha, the entire United States fits from east coast to west coast in the North American continent. Of course, it doesn't take up the entire continent, but east coast to west coast, half of the continent. When you look at that, and then you add in Hawaii and Alaska, and how big that actually is, and how many people are actually here—320 million people—and you start talking about size and scale, and you look at what's happening in America politically, and you have. Uh, such strong differences between the left and the right, and and uh, they don't see eye, eye to eye on many subjects now. His response is, that's okay. Let's just talk about decentralization, because that would solve these problems. right? We could have a South that's uh, more interested in things that the South is interested in, the West, a California, or a New England. This is the entire point of our conference in November of last year. It's very tolerant. It's a tolerant response to a hostile and intolerant time. Southerners, as Clyde Wilson pointed out a long time ago, could go their entire lifetime without even worrying about what happens in Oregon. And many of them do. They don't care what happens there. Now, people in Oregon, some, for some reason, care what happens in the South. But Southerners don't really care. It's this idea of cultural imperialism that's at the heart of every conflict in America. New Englanders worried constantly about what happened in the South, whereas Southerners could care less about what happened in New England. They really didn't speak about it unless they were attacked. You see, that's the cultural imperialism. When you talk about Northern nationalism, it's always a disguise for Northern sectionalism in the 19th century. Daniel Webster was a Northern sectionalist, and he only became a nationalist when it, when it helped New England. So, that's the important part to understand about New England nationalism. It's actually sectionalism. Uh, Southern nationalism was something different. I think you can honestly say that Henry Clay was a real nationalist. I mean, he was from Kentucky. He thought that nationalism would benefit every section. He thought it would benefit the South, the North, and the West. Whereas Daniel Webster thought it would benefit the North. Uh, when you look at Calhoun and his nationalism in 1816, again... The Tariff of 1816 was throwing, the, throwing a bone to the North because the war had substantially harmed their economy. So let's have a tariff. Let's be a real nationalist and have a union that really works for the union. I mean, John Taylor of Caroline was appalled at sectionalism. He thought that the best thing to do would be have a government that didn't really benefit or, and this is Calhoun's language, but of course didn't benefit or burden any of them unequally. He thought the union had to be applied equally and tariffs were unequal. The central banking system was unequal because once the central authority gets involved in divvying up the spoils, it becomes unequal. That's the whole point. You don't want a union that benefits some and burdens others unequally. Um, and it doesn't matter. At, at this time, of course, we're talking about operation on states, but we can apply this to individuals as well. That was the whole point of the federal union. So when you start talking about why people are so angry in America today. And we look at angry politics. People are upset with each other all the time. So how could we solve that problem? Well, uh, 
Don Livingston's response was, let's talk about decentralization. Let's talk about these things that are part of the Southern tradition. Of course, the Southern tradition is other things, too, as we'll talk about in this uh, particular episode as well. But this idea of decentralization would potentially be a fix for the things that ail American society today. And so Alan Mendenhall talks about that we're not a nation, so why do we use that language? Because using that language becomes problematic. If one side or the other dominates the central authority, if the left dominates the central authority, if the right dominates the central authority, then the other side is going to be abused and angry. And this is what Calhoun pointed out in his disquisition on government. Part of the problem with our two-party system is that one side went out of power. We'll talk about the Constitution and how it needs to be upheld. And then once back in power, they forget all about it. This happens every single time. He pointed this out in the 19th century. Uh, nothing has changed. This is why Calhoun is the most astute political thinker of the 19th century. Maybe next to John Taylor of Caroline, but they're right there together. So, uh, when you look at Boyd Cathy's piece on Friday, he just brings us up all these problems, all of these things. The left being very uh, angry right now at Donald Trump and uh, the right. And then, of course, if, if the right is out of power, the neoconservatives are out of power, they're going to talk. They're going to be very angry at the left. And we're going to have radical transformations. I mean, this, this stuff is ongoing and people are, are bristling at these things all across the United States. This is what Marcus Rees... Evans says in California secession, look, I mean, we don't like the fact that Donald Trump's in power. We should uh, we should leave the union. You, you, the other states, you you red states should vote us out. And of course, that's exactly what the Supreme Court said could happen in Texas v. White, that uh, the other states could just could vote out of state, but they just couldn't do it unilaterally. California can't just say we're leaving sayonara. It would have had to be done by the other states. They have to boot them out of the union. So if, if the other states decided that you have to go, well, then they would have to go. So uh, Boyd Cathy is pointing this out. Is it time for the United States to break up? Is it time for America to break up? Is it time for an amicable divorce between the left states and the right states? Will that make America more peaceful and better? I mean, this is a question. Do we really want peace or do we want, do we want perpetual political conflict? And, uh, I mean, that's something that uh, I think Americans are starting to come to question. What kind of America do we want? How do we want this thing structured? What do we want it to do? And so uh, this is what uh, I think this excellent piece by Boyd Cathy points out. It can, go, it can go the peaceful way, which is the desired outcome. And that's what he's saying. We want that. We want to have this discussion about... Uh, how America could be better served. I mean, back in the 1930s, when the Southern agrarians wrote, I'll take my stand, essentially they were talking about regional government at that point. Maybe the union has benefits for commerce and defense. If the commerce, if that commerce clause doesn't become oppressive, and that means you can regulate anything you want to. But if it was simply as a free trade zone between the states, and then you had regional government to handle other things, the South, its own little regional government, the New England, its own, and those regional governments handled the domestic concerns of those areas. Maybe that would be better. You would still have the Union, but you would have these regional governments. I remember talking to a colleague of mine years ago. He was from Nigeria, and we had this conversation. He said, in his opinion, he said, well, uh, yeah, I think that would be best. The only thing he would add to it, he said, there needs to be some type of overarching civil rights legislation, too so that civil rights cannot be abused in any of the sections. And I think that in the 21st century, that would certainly happen to a point. Um, so, I mean, people are talking about these things. Well, I mean, this would be a good idea. These, will be, these are things we need to do. Um, but how do you do it? Now, there was a time when Virginia led. And when Virginia led, you had these serious discussions about federalism and regionalism and decentralization. When John Taylor of Caroline was the pamphleteer of Jeffersonianism, a real political thinker, a real scholar. And this is uh, what was said in the, in the 1850s. Virginia would just lead like it used to. I mean, Jefferson, Madison, Monroe, Washington. Virginia would just be the leaders again. Now, maybe by the 1850s, Virginia had become exhausted. And you can point, I mean, look, 1829 to 1830 is one of the most important 
time periods in Virginia history when they write their new constitution. And you had people like John Randolph of Roanoke arguing against a much more democratic Virginia because he says it's going to destroy Virginia, and perhaps it did. When you look at that constitutional convention, some of the things that were said about democracy and government power, I mean, all this stuff could be just applied to a bigger situation, bigger government. But they were talking about these issues in Virginia in 1829. One of the most important events in American history was that Virginia Constitutional Convention. The star power there was just tremendous. But the piece on Monday is driving through Virginia's historic triangle. And Brett Moffat has done a nice job pointing out some things to do and see. And I will say, for me personally, going to Williamsburg, Virginia, when I was about 12 years old, was a, was a transformational event because I became interested in American history there. It was where I decided I really wanted to do American history. Um, and it is the cradle of America. Uh, not Plymouth, not Boston or Salem, but Williamsburg and uh, the Tidewater of Virginia. That is the cradle of British North America. And a lot of the things that we talk about and we, we wrestle about, you know, uh, individual liberties. If you look at Charles Sidnor's book, American Revolutionaries in the Making, and we, we've got an essay on that in, in the, on the website. Uh, I think it's entitled From the 18th to the 20th. Uh, but when you look at that particular period, and Sidnor points out, you know, even though Virginia was much more undemocratic than even South Carolina or some of the other states, they had more liberty in Virginia because they were jealously guarding it. The Jeffersonians, what were called the Jeffersonians later on, the Republicans, the old Republicans, Norman Risdor's The Old Republicans, just a fantastic book, the old Republicans led. And they weren't all from Virginia. You had old Republicans in other states as well, but they led. Nathaniel Macon was one of those old Republicans, for example, from North Carolina. They led. And when they led, the powers of the general government were circumscribed. Now, we know that the first couple of administrations, they were not. And then, of course, the Jeffersonians came in power and they tried to restrict those powers. And they did for a long period of time. Of course, we had some hiccups there. Madison's insistence that we get another bank of the United States, et cetera, et cetera. But nevertheless, when the Jeffersonians were around, things were a little different. And this is what Clyde Wilson points out in his essay on Tuesday on Jeffersonians in the 20th century and foreign policy. People like J. William Fulbright and Robert Byrd. Uh, these are individuals that talked about a foreign policy that was not imperialistic. Claude Kitchen of North Carolina. Um, by the way, he does point out a new book. Now, this thing is going to be available uh, free of charge on the website in the near future in the next couple of months. But if you want to get it before then, you just want to have it sitting on your shelf in paper form, we have a new book out from the Abbey Hill Institute Press. It's Exploring the Southern Tradition. It's linked to it in that piece. You can go click on that and, and get it. Um, it's awesome. Uh, it's a collection of essays, 20 essays, about a variety of topics. And one of them is a piece by Richard Gamble, who teaches at Hillsdale College, on Southerners and foreign policy, the Southern anti-imperialists. And he focuses a lot on Claude Kitchen. So um, this is a, a forgotten part of the Southern Jeffersonian legacy, is this anti-imperialism. And you see it from other individuals now. I mean, look, if you watch the uh, the Democratic debates and you... Watch, uh, you know, for example, what Tulsi Gabbard has to say about foreign policy. It's very Jeffersonian. Uh, what Donald Trump was having to say about foreign policy in the lead up to the 2016 election. Very Jeffersonian. We call that conservative, but that's essentially the, uh, or you could say it's the Virginian foreign policy. George Washington and Jefferson and Madison and Monroe, they all favored that. And when you move forward in the 19th century, you had the same perspective. You know, even Zachary Taylor and John Tyler. I mean, these people were trying to avoid, avoid foreign entanglements and permanent alliances, right? I mean, this is the American way. It was the American way up until World War I. And then the American way, for some reason, has become empire and conquer. Uh, but that's not, that's not the Jeffersonian foreign policy. That's what Clyde would say is a Yankee foreign policy, and I think he's right about that. Now, Southerners have been just as aggressive at times. There's no doubt about it. But the Jeffersonian strain, this anti-Vietnam war strain, I mean, that was very Jeffersonian. 
anti-World War I, very Jeffersonian. And of course, there were those in New England who followed the same in, uh, during World War I, who were opposed to American entrance in the war. And I think overall, the American public was opposed to, the, to American entrance in the war, even in 1916, when uh, Woodrow Wilson promised he kept us out of war. I mean, that was a big deal, because uh, Charles Evans Hughes was actually favoring to get into the thing, and Wilson was saying, no, I'm going to keep us out of war. Of course, he's being disingenuous. This is why William Jennings Bryan, who have the Bryan family from Georgia, resigned as Secretary of State. Brian at that point, of course, being from Nebraska, though. Uh, so that's Jeffersonian. So we have this complex history in the South. You have this complex foreign policy view, which I think uh, Clyde brings out in his piece. You've got this driving through Virginia that talks about the cradle of American civilization in so many ways. And then you have this idea of American America as a, as a federal republic, not a nation. And is it time for a divorce? But then that piece on Wednesday brings me to that piece that I wrote, Colonial Slavery. And I brought this piece up because there's a perception that um, the North, New England, was always the good guys and the South was always the bad guys in, in modern terms. And so I begin the piece talking about a colonial governor who, in fighting a war with a, a, a nasty war with some Indian tribes in, the, in his colony, armed in his words, 200 stout Negro men. And uh, they were going to defend, they were frontline troops in this particular war. And this is, in, this is in 1718, right? So 1718, this colonial governor says, I've got 200 stout Negro men, those are his, those are his words, armed against this Indian tribe. And they were asking for other men, slaves, African slaves from Virginia, right, from Virginia, so that they could go and uh, help defend the state. Well, Virginia responds, all right, well, if we send these men to you, you got to send some slave women to us because uh, we need to replenish our population here. And this other colony said, no, we're not doing it. That would be against, I mean, first of all, would lead to an insurrection. Second of all, that would take these wives away from these slaves. Now, if you if you go to establishment uh university classes, they will tell you slaves were not allowed to have wives. But here you have, in this early 18th century, this colony saying, well, we can't do that. We can't, because these men that are fighting for this colony have wives. We can't send their wives away. That would cause an insurrection. Right? So these slaves had wives. We know that slaves married all the time. Maybe not in a in a formal ceremony like they did uh, for uh, European society, but they, in 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 these southern colonies, or anywhere they had slavery. Uh, but they certainly married. We know it. We know it happened all the time. Uh, so uh, you have that. And then on the other hand, you have a leader from another colony writing the first pro-slavery treatise in North American history, 1701. The man's name is John Saffin. He was a merchant, made a lot of money on lumber and tobacco and fishing and furs, and um, also slave trading. And at one point, he had an indentured servant, an African indentured servant named Adam, and his indentures were up, and John Saffin refused to free him. So there was a court case about this. And Saffin, and there was a, a minister in the area that wrote a scathing critique of John, Sca John Saffin for not freeing his indentured servant. And John Saffin wrote that essentially that this African indentured servant was uh, not able for freedom because of his race, that um, he was, that Africans were better off in North America. Essentially, he's using the what we would call the positive good argument that was articulated in the 19th century, not first by Southerners, actually first by New Englanders in the 19th century, because they were wrestling with the institution of slavery there first. Calhoun was an original and the positive good argument at all. That argument had been used for years. But um, here you have this pro-slavery treatise by John Saffin, first one, 1701. So about the same time you have, within a decade of each other, you have this pro-slavery treatise from one colony and this use of armed slaves in another colony. And I asked in the piece, well, where are these colonies? Well, the pro-slavery treatise was written in Massachusetts and the armed slaves were in South Carolina. Yet, if you again, if you take the mainstream 
establishment history courses, you're going to learn that South Carolina, that slaves were never armed, slaves never had firearms, slaves never had any of these things, and that all pro-slavery information comes from the South. But this is exactly, this is not true. So the question has to be, well, what happened? I mean, why did South Carolina become much more rigid in its defense of racial stratification? Well, because at first, the Stono Rebellion, which took place in 1739, that caused some alarm. Um, that was one of the reasons. And then, and then over time, you know, you would see uh, uh, as the growth of slavery took place, you would have racial attitudes stiffen. But certainly, even in the 1660s, all men in the Carolinas, all men, didn't matter if you were free or slave, were required to be armed to defend the colony against the Spanish or the French or the Indian tribes. And so that was the case, and the governor was very open about it. Whereas in New England, where you had slave trading as one of the primary forms of commerce, and you did have slavery, um, and you had uh, John Saffin actually educated by the fut- one of the future presidents of Harvard. And this was the case for a lot of Southerners as well. They went up to Harvard and Yale and Princeton, and they were educated by pro-slavery ministers there. And so they came back and brought that defense, that biblical defense of pro-slavery with them. And so this is where the complexity of American history comes into play. You had two different colonies, two different worldviews, even then, about things. And uh, we, don't, we don't take that into account. And, of course, the, the idea of federalism is supposed to handle these differences and allow for peace between peoples. But if you create nationalism, you cannot have that. Because one side has to win and the other side has to lose. And when it's a razor-thin majority, and that's what we're talking about here, razor-thin majorities, you can say, well, it was you know, 3 million votes. All those votes came from California. So essentially, if you take out California, we have razor-thin majorities in America. And so are we happy with the fact that if there's 101 people, 51 of the 101 people can decide what 50 people will do? Are we happy with that in America? Is that the best form of government? Uh, Or would federalism solve these problems? These are the questions that are being asked in a complex place like America, which it is. And as I said at the beginning, New England has its own kind of worldview. I mean, Bernie Sanders is New York slash Vermont. He works in New York slash Vermont, but does he work in, in the South? I mean, some people would vote for Bernie Sanders in the South. I'm sure of it. Uh, some people vote for Donald Trump in New England. But the culture of their, those areas, does do those candidates work in those areas, uh, outside of those areas? Does uh, Kamala Harris work outside of California? Does Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez work outside of New York? Does Mitch McConnell work outside of Kentucky? Or Sonny Perdue? Or take your pick of a southern or northern congressman or congresswoman. Do they work outside of their areas? Does Klobuchar work outside of the Midwest? Uh, you know, when you listen to her, she sounds like she's from the Midwest. Don't you know? So, I mean, this is this is the question that has to be asked, and it's something that I think these pieces, all the pieces this week, do a nice job addressing. The complexity of America, the fact that the United States has never been a nation in the strictest uh, sense of the word, and that nationalism is actually part of the problem, not the solution to the growing conflict in America. You take away the idea that we have to have top-down government, and a lot of this violence, political violence, political conflict goes away. It melts away because you would have culture, the the regional and state cultures determine what those states are going to be like. I mean, look, no one's saying Alabama has to govern the United States, and no one should say that Massachusetts should govern the United States or New York or California or Georgia. That would be the peaceful and responsible and, most importantly, southern and original founding thing to do. Until next time, good day. Good day.